a great pleasure to mark the first anniversary of the Abdul Latif Jamil Institute for Disease and Emergency Analytics um, with a discussion with Tony Blair, who needs no introduction, but has been the longest serving uh, Labour Prime Minister to date and three election time winner, and now heads the Tony Blair Institute for Global Change. Tony, it's a pleasure to be here today. Thanks, Neil. My thanks to, to you and all the work that's been done by the Jamil Institute as well. It's a great organisation. Thank you. It's been an unprecedented year for us all. I couldn't have imagined being where I am now a year ago. Um, what was most surprising, unexpected for you? The most surprising thing for me has been the absence of global coordination and political leadership on what is an unprecedented crisis, I mean, the biggest challenge that government has ever faced in terms of um, scale, logistics, and it's been completely global. In other words, all countries face basically the same problem with their own context and circumstances, but essentially the same problem. How do you um, cut down the disease, control it or eradicate it? And yet the, the, the global leadership that you would expect in such a situation has just not been present. And if it had been, I think we would have all got through this a lot quicker. Yes, and it's a paradox that scientifically there has been immense coordination. I was on a call this weekend with many scientific leaders across Europe, but it hasn't materialised in a political sense. Um, and so where do you think we are now? I mean, from an economic and political perspective, how do you see the next six months unfolding? Well, I think we're in a, you know, a very difficult situation. Um, I think there are some big decisions that we need to take pretty fast. Um, I think there's going to be a major question as to whether we get vaccines and therapeutics out of the door quicker. I, I still think without mass testing, it's hard to get a handle on the disease. And we have had in recent times the development of much more accurate rapid tests. And I think measuring whether people are infectious um, is as important as measuring whether they actually have the disease, because some people have a very light viral load, very light form of the disease. Many people are asymptomatic. But I think getting to, to, to the what I would say are the, the four elements of this that are necessary, vaccines, therapeutics, testing, and then the other thing, which is data, having the ability to, to track what's happening and assemble you know, real-time data, uh, those are the big challenges, I think. And if we, if we rise to those challenges, then I think there is light at the end of the tunnel and we can get through this. But if we don't, then the economic damage of a further heavy lockdown, if it takes us till spring or summer next year to, to really get on top of this, or longer, then I think it's we're going to face an unprecedented economic situation. Yes, I'm, I'm struck, and you must find this in your conversations, by how similar, at least across Europe, the challenges have been faced by politicians, by communities are. Um, yeah, and it's one of the, th one of the things that you, you realise about this type of situation in government is you've got to get really organised as a government and you've got to, one of the hardest things is not taking the decision, but actually identifying what the decision is. And then I think there's been a, an inability on the part of political leaders to distinguish where science ends and judgment begins. So in a lot of the issues I've just talked about, that there are varying and different views amongst the experts and the scientists. The question is, trying to get a calculus of risk that's consistent. And one of the problems I, I've found during this is that political leaders are finding it hard to establish the right risk calculus, which has got to, to not to separate the different questions in a way, but to once you've identified each of those, to aggregate them so you can have a sensible decision around risk. So, you know, it's not a question of the economy or health. You've got to balance uh, the two because there are also other health aspects to, to lockdown. But also, 
and in addition to that, apply a consistent risk calculus. So in some areas we're applying zero risk and in other areas we're saying, well, we, we, we will take quite considerable risk. You've got to try and apply a consistent risk calculus across the piece. But again, you know, for, for governments, this is such a difficult question because it is always in the nature of a system, bureaucratic systems, to be somewhat small C conservative in the actions they take, because you will always get punished as a government for acts of commission, but acts of omission tend to get less punished. And I think understanding exponentially growing risk is a challenge in many policy circles. And the, I, I see at the moment a trade-off between being played out in the media and the political discourse of, is it society or is it health? But the fact is, if we allow case numbers to rise ever more, we, I mean, the health service in any country will not be able to cope with the pressures coming weeks. So, yeah, no, that's, that's, that's absolutely right. And in addition, by the way, if, if, if the case numbers rise in a huge way and so people find a second wave like the first wave, then quite apart from whatever the government says, people won't have confidence. And yeah. if they don't have confidence, of course, that has a huge economic and health impact. People decide, I don't, I don't want to go for my checkup in hospital because I'm, I'm too frightened to go. Or I'm, I, may be, I may be permitted to travel to work, but I don't feel safe traveling. Indeed. So I agree. I mean, it's going to be a very difficult few months. And I think clear communication and having a strategy and objectives you're wanting to um, meet would help a lot. And, and I think it's not a criticism of this government, but I see across, again, across Europe, across the world, very reactive policy making. I think the, the two big challenges, uh, along with all the others, but, but which are less obvious, is one, I think you've got to have a plan. And, and the reason for having a plan is because it's a good idea in itself, but also because if you're communicating to people, exactly what it all means and you're explaining. You know, this is where government as an explainer is such an important um, dimension. And, you know, you will give people confidence if, you're, if they feel there is a plan that you are working to. And the other thing is that you've got to make sure that the things that you're asking people to do are consistent with each other. I mean, if people feel that the rules don't make sense, then your compliance drops. And one of the huge problems we have in the UK is compliance has dropped. Now, I think one other issue which is very difficult is the degree to which, and I think politicians find this very challenging, how far are the public prepared to go in accepting quite tough surveillance in order to get on top of the disease? Because you know, if you look at a country like South Korea, they have taken some measures on surveillance pretty close to what they did in China. In mm -hmm. other words, very, very tough measures. Now, South Korea is a democracy, China isn't. But the point is, it was essential for them to get on top of the disease that this surveillance was put in place. And we prepared to do that. Now, I think personally, I think the public's prepared for some quite draconian measures if they see it's according to a plan and it actually can work. It's, it's where you appear to be changing all the time or quite uncertain and not really explaining it to people, people lose confidence. So looking, looking further forward, I mean, many people have talked about what the post-COVID world, world might look like and the lessons we should learn. Um, I mean, what do you think are some, going to be some of the longer term challenges and for matter opportunities? Because this is the biggest economic shock the world has seen since the Second World War. And as you well know, um, low-income countries have been far worse affected than high-income countries. Yeah, so it is a bit like a war in, in several senses. But here's one sense that I think is interesting. What happens when you get a crisis that is so dominant and in particular global crisis like this? is that everything that was there before the crisis is there afterwards, but accelerated and intensified. And 
therefore, what you're going to find is that many of the social concerns, inequality, uh, income stagnation, the wealthy are getting wealthier, the poor are getting poorer idea, I think you're going to find all of those things back, but with a vengeance and very, very strong. And that's going to pose a real challenge to policymakers in a constrained fiscal um, environment. And then I think you're going to find that a whole lot of things that people did during lockdown or started during lockdown, like remote working, some of that is going to continue even after COVID ends. And I think one big thing, which is a challenge and an opportunity, is that the adoption of technology is going to be accelerated. In other words, people have learned during the course of this crisis that with technology, we can do a lot uh, and we can do it differently. And that is going to be a challenge because it will mean some jobs get displaced. But it's going to be an opportunity because following this, at least in the sphere of global health and disease, we should learn the lessons of this very clearly and reorganize ourselves internationally to be better prepared in the future. I mean, that is absolutely obvious. And all of those things that we were doing in a slow and incoherent way before the crisis, we should be doing in a rapid and cohesive way afterwards. That brings me to my final question. How do you think, you know, data science, analytics, what we do in JIDEA can contribute to that? I think data is absolutely key. It's one of the things I've learned during the course of this crisis. Without data, you can't understand. And with data, if you have it at scale, <clears throat> so many opportunities open up. You know what's happening. For example, if you can use health data, you can develop whole new ways of curing disease. And that's why what, what you're doing at the Jubil Institute is so important. With good data and using good data well, the capability of that is absolutely transformative. Yes, and we can see that in terms of how people are just tracking this epidemic day by day and around the world. It has been truly remarkable compared with anything I've experienced before. Yeah, and one of the important things about your institute, but, but also other similar types of initiative, and there'll, there'll be more to come, I'm sure, afterwards, is if we did this on a globally coordinated basis, think how much better we'd be. For the UK, given we have a national health service, for us, it should be relatively simple to collect the data and extremely valuable for the country. Yeah. Thank you, Tony. Thanks very much, Neil. Great, great to chat and feel free to reach out anytime. Thank you. Thanks very much. All the very best. Look after yourself. Bye.